Welcome to the Semper Reformato podcast, spreading the word and contending for the faith. So we turn again to the book of Ephesians and to Ephesians chapter 1. Well, we're going to concentrate our thoughts this evening on verse 7 and verse 8. And Paul has been talking in verse 6, of course, as we saw last time, about the praise of the glory of his grace. We tried to explore what the word glory meant. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. I wonder just how great is the depth of that verse. This particular passage of Paul's long, non-stop sentence which bursts out of him in joyful praise at the amazing works of God in Christ for us. He talks about the riches of his grace. I don't have much in the bank. I think my wife has more than me. So if I try to count it, it's not too hard. I don't have much in the way of riches. But how could we ever count the riches of God's grace? That would be an impossibility, wouldn't it? To try to even measure the extent of God's saving love and favor for his people would be impossible. You'll know, of course, that the word grace is simply the Greek word charis. It's a fairly broad word. There are multiple English interpretations, but in this sense where Paul is talking here about our salvation, grace is simply the unmerited favor of God for sinners. And the whole idea is that our salvation is a completely free gift. You can't earn it or work for it, or deserve it. The basic idea of grace is that God loves us when we are unlovable, that he chose us to be his when we are unlovable, that he rescued us out of our sin without anything on our part that would merit such an action. And he did it at great cost to himself, the cost of the death of his only begotten Son. People sometimes express grace as a kind of acrostic. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, the riches of his grace. So tonight we want to learn a wee bit about what Paul teaches us here about God's grace. He tells us that we are delivered by grace, And he tells us that we are forgiven by grace. And he tells us that our lives are transformed by God's grace. Let's see the verses in question. Verse 7. And it begins with, in whom. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Uh, Whenever something begins in whom, it connects us to something that has gone before. So we have to ask the question, to whom is the apostle referring here? From verse 3 down to verse 6, Paul has been speaking about the work of God the Father in our salvation. God the Father chose us from before the foundation of the world. God the Father predestined us, purposed for us, to be part of his family. He adopted us as sons, but at the end of verse 6, the emphasis changes, and he starts to talk about what Christ has done in our salvation. And then near the end of this long sentence, where we finished, verse 
12 down to verse 14, he's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. So this is a Trinitarian passage. So who is verse 7 referring to? In whom we have redemption. Well, we get a clue in verse 6. We are accepted in the beloved and the beloved. That's the person. That's the person. That's the person of whom it is said in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17 that a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, speaking of the Son. And that phrase, the beloved, is used several times in the Gospels. Deliverance then comes through Christ. But even then we need to clarify that. Because there's no one else here mentioned. Deliverance comes by Christ alone. There is no one else who can save us, is there? Jesus himself tells us that. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, the Apostle Peter said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There will be no one in heaven without Jesus. That's a simple statement of fact. Absolutely no one. There's no Jesus in me here. It's all about Christ. It's in Christ alone. Not just by Christ alone, but if you look closely at the verse, it begins, in him. It's in Christ alone. You see, you can know about Christ. You can have a great intellectual knowledge of him. You may know all his parables. You may know all his miracles. You may be able to recite them. You may know his teachings and his doctrines. You may be able to rhyme off long passages from the Gospels about Jesus. You may say, I read all the red letters in my Bible. I read the words of Jesus. You may take Christ as your example, and you may try to live like he did you may even try to practice forgiveness and loving your neighbor as he did. But none of those things will be of any benefit in eternity. When you stand before God and give account of your life, you will still fall short. For Jesus did not come into this world just to be a great teacher, even though he was a great teacher. He didn't come into this world to be a medical healer, a healer, even though he has, he healed all manner of illnesses. He didn't come into this world to be some kind of a spiritual guru or your life enhancement coach to give you your best life now. He didn't come into this world to be a good example of a moral lifestyle. Jesus came into this world to be your saviour. To be your saviour and to be your Lord. So in Matthew 1 and 21, the angel speaking to Joseph said, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. From their sins. You must be in Christ in order to be saved. Deliverance comes through Christ, through Christ alone. And that is in Christ alone. You must have a living relationship with him. Steve Lawson said to be in Christ, first of all, means that we have a saving relationship with Christ it means that we are brought into union and communion with him in such a way that as we are in Christ, what is true of Christ becomes true of us. His grace and his resources become our experience and our possession. 
and you read Ephesians 1 and 2, that phrase in him or in Christ is repeated over and over. It says we were chosen in Christ. We are predestined in Christ. Right down the whole way to the Holy Spirit where we are sealed by the Spirit in Christ. And the question tonight is not do I know about Jesus? Not have I read about Jesus? Not am I trying to be like Jesus? But am I in Christ? Have I a living relationship with the Son of God who is risen from the dead. A dynamic relationship. But let's go back to our verse. In verse 7, in whom we have redemption. So we have deliverance through God's grace and we have That deliverance comes through Christ and it comes through redemption. And the whole idea here is of a slave being redeemed, being bought back at a great price. I have said that we are delivered by grace. We must ask the question, why do we need to be delivered? What do we need to be delivered from? Well, my contention is that we need to be delivered from slavery. Why do we need delivered from slavery? Well, because we are slaves to Satan. We may not like that. And we may not know it, and we may not want to think about it. But we are, in effect, in our unregenerate state, without Christ, we are the slaves of Satan. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, if you just turn over the page, and verse 2 to 3, Paul describes this for us. He says, We're in, in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So we're slaves. We're slaves to Satan. Because we're slaves to Satan, we're slaves to sin. We sin habitually. In our unregenerate state without Christ, without the the reins being placed upon our lives by the indwelling Holy Spirit, we're under the sway of our father, the devil. We do his wishes. We obey his commands. John 8 and verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So we're slaves to Satan and we're slaves to sin and we're slaves to self. We're unable to save ourselves. We're pleasing the lusts of the flesh. Why would we want to stop doing that which our father the devil is telling us when it is pleasurable to us? Ephesians 2 and verse 3. We go back to that passage just for a moment. Ephesians 2 and 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. That's what we're doing. We need delivered. And that deliverance comes through what Paul calls here redemption. Redemption of sinners. The buying back of slaves. Slaves to sin has always been God's plan. We find it right back in the Old Testament. You already know the story of the Exodus. Many years long after Joseph's death, the Israelites are still in Egypt, only now they're not there uh, benefiting from the largesse of the store of Pharaoh. Now they're there as slaves, serving a wicked and a tyrannical king, And there's nothing they can do about it. They cannot free themselves. They're a bunch of half-starved, worked-to-death slaves. And essentially, they're worthless. In the eyes of anyone, they're just slaves. They have no monetary value. They have no intrinsic value to anyone. They're just slaves that nobody wants. 
and just work them to death and break them so that they can work. We're stuck under that cruel regime. Just as we are slaves to our father, the devil, just as we are in his grip, we cannot escape. But God intervened. And in grace, in Exodus 6, verse 6, Moses is told, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, not Pharaoh. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from the burden of the Egyptians, and I will rid you of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. So what use is this bunch of half-starved, work-to-death slaves? Well, that's what grace is all about. God is rescuing and delivering people, not because of their value, but because they are helpless, worthless sinners. We have no other way of escape except through his grace. And look at how he does it. In whom we have redemption through his blood. That's the cost, the buying back of the slaves. Jesus rescues us. He ransoms us at great cost. He pays the price for us. We have redemption through his blood. Let's go back to the story of the Exodus just for a moment. It was God who set those slaves free. And it involved a lamb. A pure lamb. A lamb without any blemish, a lamb that was slain. The blood of the lamb sprinkled upon the doorposts and the lintels of the home of the Hebrew slaves. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 7. They shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And on the appointed night when the angel of the Lord swept over Egypt, bringing the just wrath of God upon sin, these slaves had this wonderful promise, a covenant with the Lord. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that's the key. Hebrews 9 and verse 22 later tells us that almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The Lord Jesus is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God that laid down his life. We're slaves. We deserve nothing but God's wrath and God's judgment. But our Savior died and his blood was shed. And when God sees the blood, he passes over us. It is God's grace that delivers us from our slavery. Mind you, there are some important practical implications that arise from this too, which affect our own Christian lives. Because Jesus paid the price for me at the cross, because he brought me and bought me out of slavery, I am no longer my own, am I? I'm bought with a price. I'm not my own man. I belong to him. First Corinthians 6 and verse 20. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are the Lord's. So we are delivered by God's grace. But we're also forgiven through grace. I said a few moments ago that when God sees the blood, he will pass over you. That was the promise given to the Hebrew slaves. And the blood of Christ cleanseth us from all sins. But let's not think for one moment that that implies that God can overlook our sins. 
There's lots of verses that speak about how God is love. And there are plenty of people who will tell us, especially evangelical people, will tell us that, look, God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. And he loves you unconditionally. And he loves you just as you are. And people will take that and they will bank it. And they will say to themselves, well, if God loves me just as I am, then he must love me and accept my lifestyle. Surely he must overlook a little minor indiscretion or two. Surely God must overlook a few things. And if he loves me just as I am, why should I have to change what I'm doing? I heard the most blasphemous thing through the week. Or some lesbian person, gay person rather, I'm, I'm saying person because I don't know whether it was a man or a woman because they, it was hard to tell from the appearance. This person was standing arguing with a street preacher who had been preaching the gospel and she was saying to the street preacher, I'm, a, I'm gay and God made me in his image. So if I'm in God's image and I'm gay, God must be gay. Blasphemous, isn't it? But isn't this the way they're thinking? God must love me as I am. But there's something else we have to remember. God is love. But God is also just. Because God is just, his justice must prevail, or he wouldn't be just. And his justice is perfect because he knows us even better than we know ourselves. When a defendant stands in court before the jury in a trial, the jury has to try and decide if the man in the dock is guilty. They have to try and work out, is he telling the truth? They have to weigh up the facts. Is this man telling what actually happened or is he just spinning a yarn? And they have to weigh up all the facts and reasonably come to a conclusion that the man is either innocent or guilty. God doesn't have to do that because he knows our guilt. He sees right into our hearts. He knows our thoughts and he knows our motivations. And his judgment is perfect. And he knows that we have broken his law. And because his judgment is perfect, his punishment is appropriate. The soul that sins shall die. And because of God's justice, he can't just overlook my sins. Instead, he did something even better. He forgave me. He forgave my sins. He placed all of my sins upon his son who took my place. And Paul describes this as the riches of his grace. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. First Peter 2 and 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Joel Biggie had a comment on Facebook through the week, and with it there was a photograph He'd met a man, he'd been at a conference somewhere, and he'd met a man outside the conference hall, standing, preaching the gospel. And he was standing on steps, and attached to the front of the steps was a placard. And there was a message on the placard, and the message on the placard read, God doesn't accept you just the way you are. That's why you must be born again. That's closer, isn't it? the truth we are forgiven through grace so we're delivered through grace and we're forgiven through grace and lastly then we're transformed through grace 
wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Verse 8. You see, being a Christian involves a new life. It's not just turning over a leaf. It's not just a New Year's resolution. It's not deciding to be a better person or cleaning up your act. It's not some kind of spiritual rehab. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, an entirely new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 8, we're told that God abounded toward us in all wisdom and grace. Now, the word toward us is a difficult word to understand. and Even some of the commentators differ on it. Does it mean that God is referring, what Paul is referring here to God's wisdom and prudence in saving sinners? Is that what he's talking about? Or the wisdom and prudence that he grants to sinners when he regenerates them. Let's assume that both are true. And then let's move on and say that in this case, I'm going to say, I'm going to say that this is the evidence of the radical and complete transformation in the Christian's new life. Because it is true that grace transforms the way we think. He gives us wisdom. At least that's what should happen. The Greek word for wisdom, of course, is simply Sophia. And I suggest that one evidence of that divine wisdom is that we will recognize more clearly when we sin, when temptations come, when evil or immoral thoughts cross our minds, even in our unregenerate state, will we simply ignore them? as we do in our unregenerate days. Will we enjoy them, perhaps look for ways to enact them? But in the Christian life, in the transformed life, when such mental distresses come, we immediately are pricked in our conscience. We regret them. We mourn over them. We loathe them. We repent of them. We deny ourselves. We take up our cross and follow Christ. And we do not follow our carnal desires. Grace ought to transform the way that you think. And if you're still enjoying your sin, and if you're still allowing your sin to flourish within you, and you're, and you're not sorry about it or, 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 or concerned about it, then you have to ask the question, have I genuinely experienced the transforming grace of God? And grace transforms the way we act. Paul talks here about prudence. Acting intelligently. The Greek phronesis just means right-mindedness. Understanding practical insight, the inward renewal of the mind will result in our outward walk being different from those around us as we live out that transformation, that inward transformation. Not perfect, not by a long chunk, but definitely different. Different in speech. Your speech should reflect the fact that you have been with Jesus. Your works, your actions. And grace reveals God's will to us in Ephesians 1 and verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. But that's a topic for another study. So, we have got a transformed life. Now, this new birth that transforms us so radically is not something that we do ourselves. It's not by means of a religious ritual. It's not by joining a church or being baptized or being confirmed. It's not about having some form of religious ceremony performed for you. When Paul was writing to the Galatian believers, he was countering the teachings of some Judaizers who thought that you had to undergo an ancient religious ritual in order to be a Christian. You don't. Not at all. Ceremonies in churches are worthless as far as making you a Christian is concerned. 
It is grace that transforms lives. Paul wrote in Galatians 6 and 5, For in Christ, oh there's that term again, In Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature, a new creation. Religious acts and rituals and ceremonies cannot save you. A new creation, which is the result of a new birth, and spiritual transformation, a new nature in Christ Jesus. So, grace delivers us through grace that we are forgiven. We are transformed through God's grace. So here's my question. Have you been a recipient of this transforming grace? This unmerited, unearned favor of God who gave his only begotten Son for you on the cross. And have you received that grace by faith alone, simply trusting in Christ's finished work, his atoning, saving work on the cross as being sufficient to satisfy the wrath of God, God's justice upon your sin or to put it more simply have you been born again thank you for listening If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please help to make it better known by opening the podcast app on your phone or mobile device. Then, search for The Semper Reformata Podcast. Subscribe and give it a 5-star rating. See you next time.